Hello, I'm Ted Gurch, the Associate Principal E-flat clarinet with the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. Today, I thought we'd talk about some of the more unusual sounds a clarinet can make, which we call extended techniques. Composers have been asking us to push the boundaries of our instruments ever since our instruments have been around, and it really helps general technique just to work on these things. So it helps to talk about them today. So conventional technique on the clarinet um, is really built on five pillars to me. There's the fingerings that you use, the embouchure with your jaw position, your breath support is very important, of course, and the voicing uh, is maybe the most important. Articulation is also there. Uh, voicing is really the interior shape of your tongue and throat, and it's where we find the absolute center of every note. I think it's the thing that really helps um, experienced players sound the most polished. So one of the most important ways to work on voicing would be to get familiar with the overtone series on the clarinet. Clarinets are unique in that, unlike the other woodwinds, we don't overblow an octave from our lowest note. We overblow an octave and a fifth, which gives us a really wide range. We can get used to producing these overtones purely with our voicing. Uh, a good way to get started is to put a mute in your clarinet. So if you have an extra mute around, in this case, a swab where it works great, just stuff it in there. If you finger a full B, you can get a lot of uh, great overtones. It sounds like a little tiny bugle. You can amuse your friends and pets with this. Once that feels pretty easy with the swab, you can work on taking the swab out, which might make it a little bit more difficult, but still great exercise in, in your voicing. So a way to work with all those overtones, maybe in a more controlled way, is by playing multiphonics. Well, like, like the name implies, a multiphonic is more than one sound at one time. So to get those notes to come out, most of them are based, based on a subtone on the bottom, which we can get by fingering a low note and maybe picking up one of your higher fingers. That sort of takes away the low note and you'll hear a subtone. Now that's a subtone is something we hear quite a bit, maybe by accident, especially when we're trying to articulate notes in the upper register. That's a sound we sometimes hear our students play or we might struggle with ourselves at times. But if I make that sound on purpose and then adjust my jaw forward and my voicing inside my mouth, I can accentuate the upper harmonics, the upper partials. And when, that, when you hear that, it'll spread out and fill in. So being, being able to control that is a great way to work on your voicing. And of course, it appears in many compositions, so it's a good skill to have. Another thing that uses voicing to really good effect is the glissando. That's when we move kind of seamlessly from one note to the other. On some instruments, it can sound really elegant, and I think it can on a clarinet as well. But usually on a clarinet, it's used in a more jazzy kind of a context. Now, to make that sound, it's almost purely voicing. You could probably tell at the end all my fingers were up for quite a while. A good way to get started working on it, though, is to just play a note and work on how flexible you can get. Maybe try to do a few drops, get further and further away. Eventually, you can kind of start letting your fingers help out. And um, you get this kind of flexible place in your voicing where you could almost play any note. You can even reverse that and move our fingers a lot 
and try to keep the note the same, which can be a good exercise. So maybe not the most pleasant sound for anyone listening to you practice, but it is a great way to get yourself centered on the note you want to play. Another thing we can do that involves the voice, but maybe not necessarily the voicing, is to growl or sing into the instrument while we play. The closer we get to the note with our voice, the more distorted it'll sound. Sometimes this can sound distorted enough that it gives the appearance of a flutter tongue. A flutter tongue is simply when you roll an R and play at the same time. So, but while we play. For me, I really need to push my jaw forward while I do that to avoid having it subtone. Another technique that involves mostly the fingers, is microtones. That's where we fill in the notes in between the half steps. Composers often ask for quarter steps. Sometimes they ask for just a little bit sharp or flat. What we try to do is not just adjust our embouchures for those notes so that we can maintain the same kind of timbre for all the notes. So if I try to fill in these notes, with some quarter steps. Hopefully those will all sound similar in timbre, but give us a little bit of a different shading on the pitch. Those are fun to do unless you have to do them in tune with somebody else, then it can be quite a challenge. So it's really good to work on some nice fingerings on your own instrument that work really well for you. Another technique that's primarily fingering but uses a little bit of voicing depending on how you do it is called a timbre trill. Sometimes this is referred to in a score as bisbiliando, which is like when a harp plays the same string uh, over and over again. On a clarinet, of course, we can't really do that, but we can make it sound like the notes are alternating by choosing another note with a, another fingering with a different timbre. We can also get a similar effect with the voicing by using a harmonic on a different fingering. Finally, with the articulation, we can get a percussive sound called a slap tongue. Sometimes it's more effective on larger instruments like bass clarinet or some of the saxophones, but it gives you a nice uh, pop. And what you do is you use as much tongue as you can with a lot of pressure. This will build up a kind of a suction between the reed and the mouthpiece and your tongue, and when you release that all of a sudden, it'll kind of slap against the mouthpiece.
So that's by no means a complete catalog of all the extended techniques you might be asked to play, but it's a good place to get started. And like I said, I think it really is instrumental in helping strengthen the foundation of even our conventional technique. So if you practice these and someone asks you whether the sounds you're making are by mistake or on purpose, you can answer as I do, yes. So keep practicing and thanks for watching.